You are watching Wide Field with Vivian Burchill. Welcome to Whitefield. I'm Vivian Kovsinger Birchall, your host. My guest today is Congresswoman Lori Trahan, representing the 3rd Congressional District of Massachusetts. Welcome to the show, Congresswoman. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Vivian. Oh, well, to start, what has been your political journey? Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, to be honest, my political journey probably started after college when I went uh, to Capitol Hill to work. Um, you know, before that, I was always active and engaged, uh, but I wasn't pursuing uh, politics. You know, I was uh, born and raised in a working class family in Lowell. Uh, my dad was a union iron worker. Uh, my mom was a domestic worker who juggled, you know, various part-time jobs while raising my three sisters and me. And, you know, my grandparents came here from uh, Portugal and Brazil. So, you know, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. I went to public schools my whole life. I graduated from Lowell High. Um, and, you know, I, I was only able to get to a school like Georgetown uh, because I got a volleyball scholarship to play there. Uh, and, you know, from there... I think one, that experience taught me that, you know, public education is the great equalizer, right? It's kind of put me on the trajectory that I, that I am on now. Um, and it's so important uh, to, uh, to families like the one I grew up in. Uh, after college, I, I went to go work for Congressman Marty Meehan, uh, who was the congressman uh, that preceded, he preceded uh, Congresswoman Nikki Songas. And, you know, worked there for a bunch of years uh, on a bunch of great issues. We worked on bringing down the tobacco lobby uh, and we fought against uh, advertising tobacco products to children. Uh, and we also were the original co-authors of campaign finance reform. So I really got to see how bipartisan landmark legislation uh, gets passed. Uh, but during the 90s, you know, Newt, Newt Gingrich, I guess, uh, ushered in a new level of partisanship. And it, it, it turned me off. Uh, it caused me to look at a different career. I, I pivoted and went to the private sector. I was the only female executive at a, at a tech company in Cambridge uh, for, I think, six or seven years. And then I, I went on to co-found a woman-owned and operated consulting firm um, that helped companies work on business strategy, but also how you set up um, the conditions for employees, especially women, uh, to ascend and to thrive. Uh, so it was really the 2016 election uh, that got me off the sidelines. You know, uh, when I saw, you know, Donald Trump uh, win that election, uh, it got me, you know, kind of thinking about, um, you know, the work I had done in the private sector and how we needed more women walking the halls and uh, of Congress and and uh, and at the table for so many important policy decisions. So uh, when Congresswoman Nikki Songas announced she was retiring, it was one of those rare moments of clarity. I knew I was in the race uh, and I was proud to have the opportunity to run uh, and represent my hometown uh, of Lowell in my home state and uh, and really just get to work on you know, basically ushering a, a, a better uh, environment where people can work together. I know that when there's gridlock in Washington, as we're seeing right now uh, with COVID-19, uh, that families like the one I grew up in, they get disproportionately harmed uh, when, when people aren't doing their job, when they're not finding common ground, when they're not working uh, to pass relief that families need. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's there's many you know new members of congress that feel the same way uh and we're going to have that critical mass of folks where we can really make some i think enduring change uh to the institution uh and hopefully start to heal and to to mend our country uh we can get back to a place where you know congress is actually doing what it's elected to do 
Um, you mentioned before that you were the first graduate in your family, and the way when you are talking about education, there was a glow in your eyes. So, mm -hmm. and I have read that you're passionate about education. So, dri what drives your passion for education? Well, you know, education is. Um, it's everything to a young person, right? I mean, it's uh, it kind of sets uh, up those early goals and uh, and aspirations for maybe what somebody wants to take from the classroom and uh, and commit, you know, to for a career or um, you know a, you know a, a dream in life. Uh, it opens your eyes, uh, kind of gets you out of your you know own narrow world. Uh, so you know I loved school. Uh, yeah, I loved everything about it. I loved the the, the classroom part. I loved the extracurricular part. I loved the social aspect of it. Um, but you know, for me, it was a game changer. Uh, you know, I had a a great community, of course, of of teachers and counselors and friends. Um, and I really felt supported in school. I think public education offers uh, that to you know to to students, and we we need to foster that. Um, and then there's also pla places for you know great improvement. You know, one of the things that I landed in tech, for example, and we uh, you know we had this conversation when we first met, but it was. Uh, it was serendipitous, right? It's not as though I was pursuing a career in tech. Uh, you know, we talk about STEM today and, you know, we're doing a better job of introducing that into our K through 12 environment. But the reality is, you know, there are lots of kids in gateway cities who don't know what quantum computing is or robotics or cybersecurity or uh, artificial intelligence, all these jobs of the future. And so I really do want to make sure we're connecting those dots for our young people. I want to make sure that they're engaged, they're making decisions uh, at an earlier age uh, in terms of what interests them, uh, things that they want to pursue, give them the tools that they need uh, to pursue, uh, and that's that's all. That's um, that goes for our K through 12 programs and our comprehensive high schools. But it also uh, it also factors into students who want to go to a technical school or a vocational trade school uh, or have become an apprentice. Uh, you know, I think one thing that I learned uh, through my life, you know, college was right for me, uh, and I was I couldn't wait to go to college. Uh, I knew which I knew I wanted to go to Georgetown at a in the eighth grade and I thought I had my whole life figured out, but you know, my husband knew he wasn't going to go to college, right? He didn't thrive in a classroom and he went to the Greater Lowell uh, Vocational Technical School is what it was named at the time. And he's a successful builder. And, and I think that's really important. Uh, I keep that in my mind's eye all the time that there's different paths for different people. And what we wanna be doing in our public education system is making sure that we are giving the tools and we are paving that path um, for, you know, whatever a child wants to pursue. Uh, and so, you know, I think that um, that does, that is what attracts me to education. Uh, it is the, the best way for us to create opportunity and economic opportunity for young people. Uh, and it really is just a lifelong tool. And frankly, when you get a great education, uh, you are more likely to commit, you know, to lifelong learning, right? You are more likely to lean in uh, to your curiosity. So, you know, for me, it's um, uh, it's it's everything. And we've learned a lot of lessons even in COVID uh, or during COVID about where our education system, uh, you know, uh, where it thrives and where we need uh, to reinvest. You know, right now we've been helping a lot of communities uh, get the broadband access that they need so that everybody has the ability to go, you know, remote. Uh, there's a fair amount of dead spots in, in the district I represent and we've been working uh, with, you know, local officials and Comcast to make sure that we're repairing that so everyone has equal access. Um, you know, we also know that our educators uh, are a really important part of this equation. Um, you know, we know that one in four educators have an underlying uh, condition that puts them more at risk uh, you know, for COVID-19 being a very serious illness. And so we have to address that, right? We have to make sure that we're actually increasing the pipeline of teachers so that, you know, we are offering those remote options, offering those hybrid models, and not asking our educators 
to put themselves at risk um, while doing so. So, you know, that is uh, that is something you know I feel uh, I care deeply about. Uh, one, because of how it impacted my own life, uh, but also I sit on the Committee of Education and Labor, and there's, there's just so much work um, that we can do uh, to invest in our public education and to invest in our young people. Closely related, of course, um, I wanted to uh, take a moment to hear from you what your office has done uh, to prevent suicides, because there are many uh, students who could not cope. You've talked about coping in school. But I know that we are also short on time. And uh, I just wanted to point out some of the few issues that our communities are facing. And you can answer to any of them. One is uh, mental health in school. Second mm -hmm. is housing. And third is childcare. They are all kind of interrelated. Um, what has your office done or what, have the, what trends have you observed? And um, yeah. So, well, first let me say, um, uh, you, in terms of, you know, childcare, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll, work, I'll work backwards. Um, childcare is vital. Uh, it is the infrastructure of our economy. Uh, and, you know, I think the thing that's disheartening about uh, where we're at right now is that women are leaving the economy in droves. Uh, all the women that we added, uh, to the workforce in, in you know, the last uh, 10 years, and we've been celebrating uh, those, you know, those growth rates, we're actually, you know, we're in a position where women are, are leaving the workforce because they have to stay home with their, uh, or, or so one of the parents has to stay home with their children uh, when they're learning remote, or that our childcare uh, infrastructure is buckling under, um, uh, you know, COVID. So we have to do more to ensure that our child care infrastructure is, is treated just like that as, as infrastructure to our economy. Uh, and we've passed uh, a number of bills to that effect in the, in the House uh, to, you know, basically invest $150 billion uh, into making sure that high quality, affordable options are there uh, for, um, for working parents and our essential workers. Uh, you know, you brought up the, uh, um, you know, suicide and mental health. You know, I first, as a, as a community and as a, as a district, we've, we've lost too many loved ones to suicide. Um, and, you know, I know, uh, in Acton, um, Jacob Goyette, Matthew Pierce, uh, and of course, the young uh, Tylen Cunningham. I mean, uh, it's heartbreaking uh, to say their names and um, and realize that you know we are now remembering these individuals um, rather than celebrating these young people um, uh, who should be you know with us today. Uh, and I think it's really it's really important that. Uh, in their memory, you know, we find motivation to act, make sure we're doing everything we can to prevent uh, suicide. You know, key to addressing this issue is recognizing that mental health needs um, uh, require just as much attention uh, and urgency as any other uh, form of our health. Uh, and to put it simply, you cannot have health care without mental health care. And that's why I have consistently pushed uh, for additional resources for mental health and, and substance uh, use disorder. Uh, you know, in the, in the uh, negotiations over government funding last November, I was, I was actually successful in securing um, $129 million in increased funding for substance abuse and mental health services. Uh, um, so we could improve the quality and the availability of treatment and rehabilitative services uh, so that we reduce the harmful effects of, uh, of substance use disorder and mental illness. Uh, it's so important. Um, you know, this is, um, you know, just recently, you know, we've, uh, I, I was part of co-sponsoring the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act. That would make 988 the three-digit uh, 
um, service suicide prevention um, hotline um, so that people know who to call. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, I'm proud, well, I'm proud to say that um, I voted for this legislation in the House just a couple of weeks ago. It's, and it's going to, um, I believe it's going to get the president's signature and become law. And I, my colleague uh, in the district next door, Seth Moulton, uh, has been pushing uh, for this life-saving tool. Uh, you know, it's it's so important right now that, um, especially when some folks are feeling, you know, more isolated, more alone, um, because, you know, the cold weather's coming and, uh, you know, we're not able uh, to do all the things in terms of gathering and uh, hanging out socially with our friends and our family. We have to check in on each other. Uh, we all have a role to play in making sure um, that, you know, our friends and our families are, are in, you know, a good space and to be there and to be sure to let uh, them know that we're there to support them um, should they ever need it. So uh, that is, uh, it, it's an issue that um, we can't lose sight of, uh, especially during, you know, this, this public health crisis. Um, you know, it's, uh, I have a lot of great colleagues uh, in the Congress, and, and one of them um, is uh, Annie Custer, uh, who has really been uh, prioritized and a leader on responding to the addiction uh, crisis um, and, you know, the, the substance uh, um, a substance use disorder. So, you know, I think that there is a there is a band of people uh, that I work to, uh, together with. I'm on the freshman working group on addiction. Uh, one of the bills I've introduced is the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act, uh, which would basically reduce the stigma of talking about uh, addiction. Uh, and it starts with making sure our physicians have the training that they need to have the conversations uh, with our patients and also to, uh, um, you know, prescribe treatment. So, you know, those are a few of the issues that, um, you know, we're pushing for in the Congress. Um, we see them play out in our communities and it's exactly what informs, uh, you know, the fights that I, that I, um, that I take up to, you know, Capitol Hill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Laurie for that. Um, fine. I know we're running really, short on time, but how do we create greater accessibility for all types of people to be involved, to get involved in decision making? Oh, you know, the, the, it's such a great question. And it's so timely. I think our young people have figured it out, uh, you know, and it's always been the case in our country where our young people are our greatest asset. Uh, in so many uh, domains, they kind of lead the way. I mean, when you think about the, the conversation on climate change, it is so prevalent right now. And it's because our young people are keeping it top of mind. Same with uh, racial injustice um, and, and taking to the streets and to the commons. I mean, it is, we can learn a lot uh, from watching the engagement and the energy of, uh, of our younger generations. But, you know, the reality is we, we need to make our democracy accessible to everyone, uh, not just a few. It's one of the reasons why I ran for Congress, right? I mean, I was not suited or, or bred uh, to run for political office, but, um, you know, we need more folks who have grown up uh, in, you know, working class uh, families. We need more diversity in our, in our Congress. And I was so proud to join um, the most diverse Congress ever elected in 2018. And today I serve with the highest number of women ever in our history, but we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, we need to make sure that our Congress looks like the country it represents. Uh, and that means electing more females, uh, more races across the board, more LGBTQ candidates, uh, and all of those individuals who have been counted out uh, when it comes to the American political system. So I guess, how do we do this? We run, uh, we get off the sidelines and we vote. And I'm talking to all, all those individuals out there who are at home and, and unsure of how to get involved or where to begin, you know, begin at vote.gov. It's the first step towards making sure that you're registered to vote and that you have a plan uh, to vote in this upcoming election. I, I don't have to tell you how critical it is that every American uh, make their voice heard. 
uh, regardless of who you desi decide to vote for, this is um, this is the most important election of our of our lifetime. So, um, it's uh, that's a good place to start. But I I will say I I tell folks my story um, so that they know uh, running for office is accessible uh, to anyone, and uh, and there's more support now uh, to getting a new candidate uh, off the ground and and running than ever before. Uh, so, you know, I think we're, we're entering a new dawn uh, for uh, political engagement and, uh, and it's, it's, it maybe it took uh, our country going, um, you know, through this period uh, for folks to kind of jump off the sidelines and make that, uh, make that uh, decision for themselves, but we're going to be better for it. Uh, if we have a uh, a representative government that's reflective of the people uh, it represents, it's going to be stronger. So remove those obstacles, get, you know, don't listen to all the excuses we put up in our brain to, uh, to not take a chance and, uh, and go ahead and run for office. Awesome, Congresswoman, thank you for taking the time to share your work and reflections with us. I look forward to hosting you again for another update in your work in Congress. And there are so many topics we haven't talked about, like housing, which is a phone in our community. But again, thank you for being here today. Yes, I look forward to coming back. And, uh, and thank you for having me. And we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. You stay safe, OK, Vivian? Bye. OK, stay safe. And to our viewers, right. you can watch all the Whitefield episodes on the Acton TV YouTube channel. Thank you for watching Whitefield. Till next time.